Okay, time to fix something. It's an HP 3476A digital multimeter and it has a LED display typical of uh, old LED calculators from the 70s era and it has an intermittent problem. Let's see if it still exists. And nope, the problem's not showing up here. Sometimes segment B on the uh, each on each digit segment B is uh, blank. So the problem does not exist here. And and you probably know just as well as I do that there's nothing worse than fixing an intermittent problem. Well, anyway, repair or not, I'm still going to tear it down. And I think first I'll give it a little bit of a product review. And I'm just going to start with the appearance. And just by looking at it, it is really funky. And by funky, I mean 1970s funky. It has a face that only an engineer could love. It looks like something straight out of a Neil Ardley illustration. And I really, really like it, actually. I really like the appearance for some strange reason. I think it just, the whole thing, everything works together entirely as it is. If any part of the, the form was on something else, you know, it just wouldn't look very nice at all. But this whole thing together with all of its little curves and uh, lid over the LED display, I think it's all very well put together. It has a tilting stand on the bottom here so you could lay it flat on the bench or up on an angle or even stand it up like that so if you're standing up and looking down on the workbench you can easily see the LED display. It's powered by mains 120 and the um, inputs on the side thousand volts and uh, was at 1.1 amp with a 1.5 amp fuse. The fuse is actually right in here if I slide it. There we go. So there's the, the current fuse and there's also a 32 milliamp fuse on the voltage input. And I've noticed that it's a real bitch to try to actually get this thing to slide it back into place. You really have to finagle with pushing these both fuses in at the same time and then sliding the whole thing back over to expose the holes to plug the leads into it. And I was hoping that problem would have resurfaced, but nope, everything's still working just fine. Well, let's tear it down and see what we find. So here's the serial number, and of course, no serviceable parts inside. Refer servicing to qualified personnel. Well, I deem myself qualified because I have the operating and service manual. Awesome. Now it just has two screws down here, and these are posi drive. Unfortunately, I don't have my posi drive screwdriver on me at the moment. But I do have a Phillips, regular old Phillips, that I ground down with the file to uh, kind of flatten or round round out the, basically just to dump, to dole down the point a little bit. So it has more of a, a square profile on each fin and makes a better fit into the posi drive screw. Even so, a regular Phillips without doing this probably would work but I'm just trying to get it down to as much of a posi drive as possible because it's very easy to strip these things if you don't have the proper tool. All right, it's just gonna pop right open. Wow, look at all that nice gold plating on here. Fancy schmancy. All right, a few more small screws, and I got this aluminum plate off of it, and the circuit board taken out of the bottom plastic, and look at that. 
There she is in all her glory. Nice and shiny, just like the day she was made. So let's start on the power end here. There's the, the main power going in. Goes to a 63 milliamp fuse with this little, what is that, 8, 82 ohm resistor, 10% tolerance. So that thing, when it blows, it just heats up. It's a slow blow fuse. You have to wait for that resistor to heat up to melt the solder joint right there on the end of the spring. And the spring will open the circuit. But anyway, that's on the primary side of the, the transformer. Secondary goes to a little dinky rectifier here. And then that strings on through. Or do some other stuff and voltage. And of course, there's the filter cap and a whole bunch of voltage regulation pretty much on this whole one-third of the circuit board. Here's the schematic for the power supply part. And you can see all that stuff ultimately outputting negative 4 volts and negative 159 millivolt reference, positive 159 millivolt reference, and a positive 6 volt. Oh, and there's also a 1 volt ohm reference for the, uh, the ohm meter part of it. And the power switch, well that's right down here, so this... Transformer is hooked up to mains all the time. The power switch is on the low voltage side. And then in the middle one third of the board, we've got all this other analogy stuff here. All these little IC packages and uh, trim pots and everything right there. So here's the block diagram. There's signal conditioning and limiting protection, ohms reference, input amplifier, and uh, so that just takes care of a gain, and of course in DC, that will go straight in through the switches, but if there's if you're measuring AC voltage or current, then you got to have an AC to DC converter. That goes to an integrator and polarity zero detector, and then finally to logic control and display. And this, this whole thing, that's like another good portion of the circuit board, all summarized in one tiny little block. And so that's right here. And that's this thing. This is the Crown Jewel HP part number 18130068. What the heck is that? This is all they show of it on the schematic U1 MOS control right here. There's uh, all the other analog stuff right here to logic control and doesn't even say which pin, but I'm pretty sure it goes to this chip and then little uh, some other settings here some trim pots and then to the display driver and that's all this up here a bunch of transistors and the led display and so let's look at the list of parts u1 there's the hp part number and a hybrid so it's basically just an nmos hybrid ic not field replaceable for repair use rebuilt printed circuit board assembly part number blah 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 so this thing if this thing is busted at all when it comes to the led display with some of the segments being out then it's technically not field replaceable if i really wanted to i might have a crack at replacing this and then of course i had to recalibrate everything but as far as uh, hp service tech is concerned Certainly not worth the time to try to replace that if it is at fault for anything. Some details on the circuit board layout right here. There's these little solder pot insulated junctions right here. You can see how they, they go through the circuit board. Looks like they're made of Teflon. And it's just, you know, a whole bunch of, some of them have quite a few parts that one right there it has four leads going into it and i don't know if they included these things just for convenience because they're very compact and you can put a whole bunch of leads into a small amount of space or maybe they're there for electrical isolation to try to minimize conductance between traces as much as possible it seems like they certainly do have some kind of a guard ring going on here there's this trace right there, 
Let me try to point that out better. This trace here, looping around and then almost touching this pin on the hybrid, but it's almost, basically it's completely surrounding these two junctions. And then there's another bit of that trace coming around here and underneath this blue resistor and ending in a little T shape, if you can just about see that right there underneath the resistor. So it doesn't really go anywhere, it just stops right there. And then there's another little T. Let me move this out of the way. There you can see it. So there's that little T stop. And it's just, uh, well that actually goes to the other side of this one microfarad capacitor. But you can definitely see there's some guard trace type stuff going on here. Even, even there's this piece right here on the top and on the bottom of the circuit board. This whole ring going around here hooked up to ground, earth ground on the other side. And so that's just certainly serving some, uh, some guard ring purposes for sure. Here's a little something else. Looks like we got a bodge wire going down here. It's all nice and covered up with uh, some kind of yellow potting material. But you can see why they included that bodge wire because the trace that's supposed to be there is actually broken right there. It's just tapers off to very, very thin and completely broken at that point. So it looks like this board must have been chemically etched and I think in some places etched a little too much. There's even this trace right here where it gets really, really thin on this corner. But nonetheless, uh, it is still conductive because they didn't bother to uh, put any kind of bodge wire on that one. And as for the LED display, well, there's all these multiplexing transistors right here. And there's the display itself. Got five digit display here, each one seven segments plus a decimal place right above segment D on the bottom. It's not in between the individual segments like you would normally see on a calculator. It's within, within the digit itself. And um, oh yeah, it has a dual lens on here. So each, each digit has its own little Fish eye lens going on top of it, and then the whole thing has this unidirection. And then there's the lenses on this thing. Each digit, of course, has its own little fish eye lens going on top of it, but then the whole thing has this other elongated convex lens going on top of it just to elongate the appearance of each digit a little bit longer in the vertical direction. And one final note before the repair, the date of manufacture. I managed to find two date codes. This IC has a 7552. And this one in the metal can looks like a 7603. So certainly 1976 is when this thing would have been manufactured. And now for the repair, I think all I have to do is just lift this thing up out of its little socket right there just a bunch of 0.1 inch space pins and then stick it back down inside that's probably what was causing the intermittent problem with the led segments in the first place segment b sometimes being off on each digit and sometimes being on just got to reseed it and clean up the contacts a little bit I don't have any contact cleaner on me, but just doing this a couple of times should be more than enough to get it fixed up. And does it still work? There we go. All the segments are lit. Let's put it back together. On second thought, before I put it back together, I just want to check to see how accurate it is. So it's upside down, but I'm just going to... I already have it hooked up to a voltage source. Let's crank it up and see what we get. Oh, it would help if I turn the damn thing on. Here we go. Uh-oh. That don't look good. Oh, crud. Oh, I know why. 
It's because I don't have any of the functions selected. So let me push the, the voltage button right here. Ooh, now we got something. All right. Whew. That was scary. So that's pretty good. 4.15 and 4.14. So that's pretty good, even though it's only giving me three digits of precision. At least it's being accurate compared to the fluke. Let me put the fluke in millivolt range here. So 43 millivolt and 40, yeah, it's hovering around 43 millivolt right there. That looks pretty good. I'm not going to bother with resistance and current. I figure if the, if the voltage is still good, if it's still within spec, then I'm just going to close it up and say it's a good multimeter. Good enough. Long before I started taking this thing apart and uh, making this video, I had considered a, the possibility of converting this thing into a give, giving it a battery conversion rather than powering it off of the 120 volt mains. And I thought I would need really big battery bank with a bunch of double A's or even C cells potentially but I have it hooked up to this power supply outputting 18 volts and it's only sucking up about 0 0.06 amps 60 milliamps and so that would be just fine if I use a couple of 9 volt batteries there's plenty of space on the inside of this thing especially inside the, the top or in this case the the bottom lid, the bottom piece of the plastic shell, where's my 9 volt battery? If I cut this plastic piece off of here, I could put a couple of 9 volts side by side inside here. I could also put a couple of, or rather, three NICADs or nickel metal hydride batteries, each one 7.2 volts for a sum total of 21.6. This thing accepts a wide range of input DC voltage. The DC power supply, even though it outputs a whole bunch of different DC voltages, it only inputs from the transformer and rectifier anywhere from 15 to 25 volt with uh, a maximum of 2 volt ripple. So ridiculous good tolerance for the input DC voltage of the whole regulator section. But unfortunately I can't find any practical reason to convert this into battery power because well I've got this and lots of other things just like this. This is just a much more practical um, multimeter, digital multimeter to have if you want something that's battery powered. This one is kind of a a relic and I'm just going to keep it as that. It'll certainly come in handy as a benchtop multimeter for most applications but certainly not for anything fancy or precision. So that's it for the HP 3476A digital multimeter. I'm sure this thing was a big deal back in its day in the mid 70s. Not only because it's actually digital when everything else or at least most other things would have been analog meters this thing was digital and it was also quite small. You really could have some much larger digital meters back then because they would have had much larger displays using Nixie tubes or Panaplex or, uh, or VFDs or um, what's the other one? Oh yeah, Numatron. That was another common display technology back then. But this tiny little calculator style LED and the mysterious hybrid package inside there afforded the designers to make this quite small. So thanks for watching. Please give this video a thumbs up if you learned something. See you later.